Hi, I'm Joe Graydon. I'm a pharmacologist. I'm Terry Graydon. I'm a medical anthropologist. And together we write the People's Pharmacy newspaper columns and do the People's Pharmacy radio show on public radio. And we are so delighted to be with you today. We really want to thank the local chapter of the AAUW for inviting us to talk about steps to a healthier life. We're all faced with COVID-19. Uh, the coronavirus has captured us all because of you know, the immense degree of suffering it has caused, uh, the um, illness, the number of hospitalizations, and clearly most of us now are still staying home. The question that comes up is, well, what can we do? What can we do to stay healthy in a time of COVID-19? Obviously, the first few steps are the ones you already know about avoiding infection. Stay away from people who are sick, wear your mask when you go out, wash your hands when you come in, and any other time you have a chance. But there are some other things that you can do. Uh, especially to have the best possible immune system that you can have. You know, if you think about it for a moment, 80% of the people who come down with the coronavirus recover pretty much okay. They may have a few symptoms, but overall they don't have to go to the hospital. What makes them different from the other 20% that get quite ill and have to be hospitalized. Now, we don't have the answer to that question, but I think it makes sense to have the most robust immune system that you possibly can have. And that's true all of the time, not just when we're facing COVID-19. Absolutely, so what do we do to boost our resilience? One of the things that you might wanna do is make sure you're getting enough vitamin C. You know, Linus Pauling was talking about vitamin C decades ago. And it's been very controversial, you know, can vitamin C prevent the common cold? Can it speed healing? We won't tackle that very controversial issue today. But there does seem to be some pretty good evidence to suggest that vitamin C does have an impact on the immune system, Terry. Absolutely, and particularly if you're talking about respiratory infections, systemic infections, uh, vitamin C, at least 100 to 200 milligrams a day, does seem to be very helpful. Yeah, there was a study published, what, about two or three years ago, suggesting that vitamin C had an impact on uh, the immune system and your ability to fight off upper respiratory tract infections. Exactly right. It was published in the journal called Nutrients in 2017. And uh, some health professionals that we have a lot of respect for are, in fact, taking at least a couple of hundred milligrams, up to about 500 milligrams a day, uh, just in case, just to be on the safe side. Now, there's something else that's probably equally important, maybe even more important. Well, vitamin D. Vitamin D is also very, very critical for the proper function of the immune system. You know, um, grandmothers in Scandinavia have known about this for, what do you think, Terry? <laughs> 200 years. Yeah, That's may maybe more. That's why they were <laughs> dosing up their families with cod liver oil. That's why cod right. liver oil, Well, Jeff? because cod liver oil is very rich in vitamin D. Now, they didn't do it in the summertime. They did it primarily in the wintertime, and of of course, it migrated to uh, Europe and uh, other places, including the United States. And so a lot of families, uh, whether they were in Germany, whether they were in France, whether they were in England, whether they were in Canada, or whether they were in the United States, they were taking cod liver oil. And we've heard a lot of complaints about how yucky it tasted. <laughs> well, and in fact, part of the reason that vitamin D is thought to be so helpful is that there ha has been a correlation between low vitamin D and a greater susceptibility to infection. And in fact, just this past couple of weeks, there have been two separate studies published. European researchers looked at the rates of COVID-19 and mortality from COVID-19 in European countries, and then they compared them to average blood levels of vitamin D. And what they found is that in places where blood levels of vitamin D are low, mortality rates from COVID-19 are high. So you wanna make sure that you really have adequate vitamin D on board. 
Now we have to caution, this is observational research. This is not what we call randomized double blind controlled trials. And it doesn't prove that vitamin D will help ward off you know, complications of COVID-19. On the other hand, a lot of people are deficient in vitamin D and uh, making sure that you have, what would you say, uh, around 40 microgram, uh, nanograms per milliliter would probably be a, a decent level, maybe as much as 50. And, you know, a lot of people have been told, I think, with understanding by their dermatologists, don't go out in the sun without your sunscreen. Right. But of course, wearing sunscreen keeps your skin from making vitamin D. So you may need to take a supplement. And of course, everybody's been told, you know, wear your sunglasses, uh, protect your eyes. Great idea. But we think there may be something about the sun that's different from taking, you know, the pills. And the reason I say that is because there have been a number of clinical trials that have actually not shown any benefit if you take vitamin D orally. Whereas we know unequivocally that if you have very low levels of vitamin D circulating in your bloodstream, you're more susceptible to osteoarthritis, to high blood pressure. Osteoporosis, of course. A whole bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And we sort of go, well, why is that? Why would it be that low levels of vitamin D are associated with all these conditions, but if you take pills with vitamin D, that may not be as effective. Right. And so we, we're, what are, we're thinking maybe, you know. Maybe it. you should actually consider being outside in the sunshine for 15 or 20 minutes a day. Without your sunscreen. You won't get a bad burn. In fact, you probably won't get a burn at all. You probably won't even get tan very much, which is probably okay. Your, your skin won't age, but about 15 to 20 minutes this time of year, you know, getting some sun on your face, on your arms, if you're wearing shorts on your legs, that's a great way to get enough, enough vitamin D. So if you can go out in the sun, get a little bit of exposure, and if you can't go out, maybe because of skin cancer or some other condition, then of course take vitamin D. And how much, Ter? Uh, the recommended amount is 600 international units up until the age of 70, and then from 71 on, 800 international units a day. But we actually think that a bit more is not a bad idea. You don't want to go over 4,000 international units a day because vitamin D is fat soluble and your body can hang on to it. So if you get too much, it can eventually become toxic. 4,000 international units is considered safe. Now, of course, there's another advantage to going outside exercise. Absolutely, and exercise is not only is it great for your physical health, not only will it boost your immune system, it's also really helpful for your mental health. And for getting a good night's sleep, because if you exercise during the day, sleeping will be better. And in a moment, we'll tell you a little bit more about why sleeping is so essential. Now, if you go out in the woods. Yeah, if you're outside in nature, it actually has wonderful benefits for your immune system as well. The studies have mostly been done in Northern Europe and in Japan. And in Japan, they call it forest bathing. You don't have to <laughs> take your clothes take off. Take your clothes off. No, <laughs> you don't. All you have to do is just go out and spend some time in the woods. And the effects are long lasting. One day in the woods can actually help your immune system be stronger for the next week. Now, what's going on? I mean, are you like breathing stuff? Yes. That's exactly what you're doing. You're breathing stuff, and the stuff you're breathing are wonderful, volatile, organic compounds that the trees are putting out. And they have an impact on your body, even though you may not notice it. And in Japan, as you said, this is a very popular, I won't even call it activity. It's, it's something that people take very seriously, that if you go out in the woods, you'll be healthier. So 
Not only will you get a little sunlight on your way to and from the woods, but by breathing in those special chemicals that trees and plants are emitting and you're not even aware of, you're boosting your immune system. Exactly now, right. In the days of, of the coronavirus, there are some interesting compounds that may be beneficial. And the one that comes to my mind is something called quercetin. That's spelled Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, quercetin. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from plants. There are a lot of foods, actually, that are good sources of quercetin. Onions and apples, tea, kale, lots of plants like that are uh, strong sources of quercetin, which plants make in order to protect themselves from bugs, basically. And people take quercetin for allergies. So this might be a great time of year to add a little quercetin to your regimen. And what we've been told is what? 500 milligrams twice a day. Exactly right. And it might be helpful against the coronavirus. Not a cure, clearly, but may be beneficial. And why is that, Terry? The reason that could be true is that it opens the doorway in the cell membrane to help zinc get into the cells. And zinc is very important for your uh, immune system function. Yeah, we call it a zinc ionophore, uh, basically a gateway. And by getting zinc, into the cell where it can do its job, which is as an antiviral, right. it may be able to um, prevent the coronavirus from replicating as effectively as it would normally. Now, of course, you also want to make sure that you're getting adequate zinc. And one of the best sources are shellfish. If you don't like shellfish or you can't eat shellfish for one reason or another, perhaps because you're allergic, you may want to think about a supplement and about 40 milligrams to 50 mm -hmm. milligrams a day is considered safe and may do the job. 50 milligrams is probably a bit high for every day, but for just a short time, if you're trying to protect yourself, it should be fine. Now, um, what else do we have when it comes to... Well, one other supplement that you may not have heard about that can also improve your immune system is something called NAC or N-acetylcysteine. And there is research that was published in the European Respiratory Journal way back in 1997. They were looking at influenza virus and they found that elderly people who took this N-acetylcysteine, 600 milligrams, twice a day, were much less susceptible to influenza. So let's see, we've got a couple of things that you should be thinking about. Number one, vitamin D. Number two, vitamin C. We think that it would be a good idea to get enough zinc, either from your diet or from a supplement. Uh, we think quercetin is a really interesting dietary supplement. We do, now, and we think that N-acetylcysteine, or N-A-C, NAC, if you want to... Can be very redo. helpful, and in fact, there was research published just in uh, 2020 showing that it improves the immune response to RNA viruses, and of course, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 is an RNA virus. Now we promised we'd talk a little bit about sleep, and sleep turns out to be the foundation for good health. Absolutely. Even in times when we are not in pandemic, you want to be getting adequate sleep. Now why is it especially important in the days of COVID-19? Because it really helps your immune system. So um, if you can, seven to eight hours minimum, and uh, you'll be doing something good for your body, uh, not just for your, your immune system, but it'll help control eating, it'll help with high blood pressure, good for a whole lot of things. Absolutely, sleep is really important. And Joe, another thing you might wanna consider, probiotics. Now, we've heard a lot about probiotics in the last couple of years for, you know, dare we say it, bowel function. So, you know, it, when, when your digestive tract isn't quite working the way it should, or you've taken antibiotics and things are a little uneven, 
you know, people go, yeah, yeah, I need to have probiotics. But probiotics are really essential for the immune system as well. They really are. And it turns out that probiotics can boost the resistance to RNA viruses. That research was published in 2018. Now, when it comes to probiotics, uh, people want to go, well, you know, what do I take? I mean, there's so many brands out there. There's there so are. many different kinds of there probiotics. Are. And so which ones are good for the immune system? And I think lactobacillus. Lactobacillus. There are several different strains of lactobacillus that are helpful for the immune system. Okay. What else are we talking about when it comes to healthy living? Well, I think we should really talk about stress relief. These are very stressful times. Oh, man. Times. I mean, all you have to do is turn on the news and you are going to be stressed out. And So, uh, one recommendation, don't listen to the news right. all day, every day. And especially stop watching at least two hours before bedtime. Just looking at a screen will impact your ability to get a good night's sleep. Right. So consequently, you might want to spend some time doing something you really enjoy, whether that's listening to music. Or reading a book. Reading a book, taking a walk. All of those things are, are really very helpful. And Obviously, you need to keep up with the news to some extent, but don't overdose on it just because you're home all day. Now, I would like to recommend a hot bath because a hot bath really does help improve sleep because when your body starts to cool down that's when the melatonin comes out and it just helps you ease into sleep so a great way to reduce stress is about uh, i'd say half an hour to an hour before bedtime hop in a hot tub wow, that sounds great and if you need a little herbal boost to help you relax we like ashwagandha it's good for stress relief it helps your sleep and it can even relieve arthritis pain to a certain extent. Now, you better spell ashwagandha. Oh, I better had because it's hard to spell. It's, uh, it's from the subcontinent. It's traditional Ayurvedic herb, and it's A-S-H-W-A-G-A-N-D-H-A, -A -A, ashwagandha. Uh, the Latin name is Withania somnifera, which suggests that it does help you sleep. Well, one of the uh, frequent guests on our radio show is Dr. Tarone Lodog. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lodog is probably one of the country, maybe the world's foremost authorities on the science behind herbal medicines. And uh, Dr. Lodog has called ashwagandha the herb that is really helpful if you're tired and wired. Right. So that it can really take the edge off that stress and really help you relax so you can get to sleep. So that's another uh, natural product that we think is certainly worth consideration. Now, probably the most important things for living a healthy life are things that your grandmother told you. Don't you think? Yes. So what, what did, did grandma, grandma say? say? <laughs> she said, eat your vegetables. How about that? Yes. You eat enough vegetables, you're going to get plenty of quercetin. Indeed you will. Grandma said, go out and play. And of course, what she meant you know, when we were kids is run around the backyard, uh, go exploring. Well, maybe that's a little harder now uh, with the uh, coronavirus out there. But if you can exercise, we encourage you to walk daily. And we love step counters because it's something that you can check on and make sure that you are, in fact, getting in the number of steps that you need. We recently talked to Dr. Steve Nissen, who is uh, one of the country's foremost cardiologists at the Cleveland Clinic. And he, he walks the walk. Yes. <laughs> His walk takes him 17,000 to 18,000 steps a day, now, which I must say is a lot more a lot. than we're doing. But if you can get in five to 10,000 steps a day, now we're talking because that will mean that you are going out to play as grandma recommended. Absolutely. Grandma also said, get a good night's sleep. And she said, visit your grandma. She did. Now, of course, visits like that are much more complicated now. If you can visit electronically, you can do it with FaceTime or Skype or just a telephone call. That's important. And it doesn't just have to be your grandmother. She may not even be around anymore. But the people who are important to you in your life stay in touch with them. Yeah, I'm really getting tired of the term social distancing because I don't think we have to social distance. We have to physical distance, but we need to stay in touch. So if you haven't called your favorite 
relative, if you haven't talked to your friends, Best friend, yeah, yeah, you know, just pick up the phone. Uh, yeah, try a Zoom, try Skype, try all of those electronic measures. But you know what else? Write them a note. Just just <laughs> sit down and so write. Far. The post office is still it's working. Still, it's still doing its thing. And so if you could just write them a note, just imagine how thrilled they'll be to get a note from you and how happy you would be if you could get a letter from them. Well, what's the, the last few things that we're going to say? We're almost out of time. Well, I'll tell you what. There actually was a study published just last month in JAMA Internal Medicine, and they were looking at lifestyle factors that help people live long, healthy lives. Just living long if you're not healthy is not an advantage. But these, these habits, these health habits, really did make a difference and kept people healthy longer. So you're not going to be surprised to learn that not smoking is right at the top of the list. Also, maintaining a healthy weight is also very important physical activity on a regular basis. And here's one that you might not have thought of. Moderate alcohol consumption also came out as very important. Now, what is moderate alcohol consumption? For women, and because we're talking to the AAUW, I'm going to focus on women. For women, they considered that anywhere between 1 and 14 drinks a week so that wow. could get you all the way up to two drinks a day, which I think is actually uh, maybe, more than moderate. Right. I would ratchet that back a bit. No. But a glass of wine every now and then is not a bad thing. Now, if you don't drink alcohol, you shouldn't start. Don't start. But if you do have a glass of wine now and again, it might be good for your health. And there you go. Here is the publication from JAMA Internal Medicine. Well, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, we, we actually have just a couple of questions that they wanted us to answer. Oh, Aside from, we're this almost is the out of time. Session. This is the question se section. So, what should elderly people eat to stay healthy? Elderly people should eat the same things that other people are eating to stay healthy, which means mostly a Mediterranean diet. But elderly people might want to focus just a bit more on the protein. So maybe a little more fish, a little more egg, a little more beans, and less of the carbohydrates for sure. Right. We, we think the white stuff, you know, white bread, white rice, um, white potatoes. Yeah, those things that uh, make your blood sugar soar quickly, those are not good for anybody, and they're definitely not good for elderly now, people. Now, you will find um, a pretty complete description of the Mediterranean diet, because a lot of people go, well, well, wait a minute, there are a lot of countries on the Mediterranean. That's right. What, what should we be eating in a Mediterranean diet? And you will find that in one of our books, the People's Pharmacy Quick and Handy Home Remedy Book uh, that was published by National Geographic. You'll find it at peoplespharmacy.com. What else? Well, the other question is, uh, what are your most outlandish recommendations that people have offered you? Oh, well, I'd say for me, it would be soy sauce for a burn. And we keep hearing from people every time they burn themselves in the kitchen. Now we're talking kitchen burns, minor to moderate household burns, not third degree. That's emergency room stuff. But if you can get it under cold soy sauce, People say it works great. And how do you do that in the kitchen? Well, uh, a radio announcer once told us that if if when she burned, she picked up a hot a hot pan, and it was like really nasty. Uh, she got out a kitchen glove, you know, the kind you would use to wash dishes, and she just poured the soy sauce into the glove, and then she sealed it up with a rubber band, and, and she had the the soy sauce in contact with her hand for you know couple maybe hours. a couple hours. She said the burn was never bad. Yeah. So it's, it's an amazing home remedy. Of course, now, yellow mustard also. Yes, that too. And how about putting soap under the bottom sheet? Now, some people say it didn't work for me to keep away the leg cramps, but other people... Well, for a lot of people, it really does work. And it's, it's not complicated. It's not expensive. But the fragrance is important. We think that the, the fragrance has to be um, limonene. It may need a little limonene in it, which is a, a part of a lot of different floral fragrances. So. Right. You'll, uh, people say, which soaps work best? I think Irish Spring 
and um, one more. Ivory. Ivory, yeah. yeah. And Ivory Spring and Ivory, I think, both have limonene yes, in them. Yes, they do. Now, you mentioned yellow mustard, Joe. Right. You mentioned it for burns, putting right. it on the burn. But also, people swallow yellow mustard for cramps. Right. And we've done that ourselves. And it, it works. It takes about two minutes max to take away your cramps. And you, know, you can get you know those little packets in the fast food restaurants well you I guess nobody's go into nobody's a going in restaurant. there anymore at the moment but have it by your your bed stand and uh, if you get a leg cramp at night you can just swallow that little packet One, not the it, take off the yeah, not do with, not swallow, swallow the, the packet. foil just the, the mustard in the packet <laughs> you need to be careful <laughs> And one last yes. remedy, my favorite, chocolate chips for hiccups. Right. And there's actually some science to support the active ingredient in chocolate as what we call an anti-tussive, meaning anti-cough. So that would be for cough. Exactly. And so chocolate chips, double, double benefit for hiccups and for coughs. And that, I think, concludes our session and we are so thankful that you invited us.